For the most part, our nation's leaders have been united in response to COVID-19, but on education, the divisions and tensions are clear. How and when should students and teachers get back in the classroom? It's the single biggest disruption to education in generations. So tonight, what are the longer term impacts and who's losing out already? You've been sending in your questions from all over Australia and our panel is standing by to have that conversation. You've got the questions, now let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Hi there, welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the U University of Sydney, Lisa Jackson-Pulver, who's an epidemiologist and remains in the reserve of the Royal Australian Air Force. He's been homeschooling his kids and advising the government on the critical decisions, Deputy Chief Medical Officer Nick Coatesworth. He oversees the largest school system in the country, head of the New South Wales Edu Education Department, Mark Scott, and principal, principal of Whittlesea Secondary College in Victoria, Leanne Davies, who's been driving remote learning even before COVID-19. We'll also go live to the Federal Education Minister, Dan Tien, tonight to put some of your questions to him. We'll have a better frame shot than that by the time we get there. And we'll meet some students as well in their final and most important year of school. Have there been tears? Yeah, there's been a, like a little bit of tears. It's embarrassing, but it's true. Well, we'll hear about the tears later. Remember, you can stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and the Gram. Quanda is the hashtag. Please, of course, play nicely. We've had hundreds of questions pouring in and our first question tonight pretty much sums it up. It's from Asha O'Keefe in Tawong, Queensland. Uh, cranky indeed. I want to get to the specifics of his situation in a moment, but Nick Coatesworth, can I start with you? Because this question of when does my school open, at this point in time, does not have a simple answer for any student in the country, does it? Well, Hamish, firstly, thank you, Asher, very much for that question, um, because it is the one on everybody's lips. I will say that the health advice regarding school closures in, in COVID-19 has been uh, consistent from the start, which has been uh, that we think school closures have had a limited effect on, uh, on the COVID-19 epidemic and in actual fact uh, that the advice has been for schools to remain open. Now, it is the reality that across the country, a lot of students have been uh, online learning, have not been in the classroom. Uh, but where we are now is in a position where every single jurisdiction is in varying degrees actually considering their approach to restarting face-to-face uh, -face teaching. So whilst each jurisdiction is different, uh, we can be clear at the moment that every jurisdiction is moving in that direction based on such a great job that Australians have done to control COVID-19. Do you accept, though, that for students and for parents and for teachers, that consistency that you are claiming exists may not be apparent to them? Yes, I do. I, I absolutely agree as a, as a parent and as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer when we see that different states are doing different things that, that can send a confusing message. But So we need to take a step back to the principle which is that schools are safe places because children don't tend to get the disease as severely uh, they don't tend to transmit the disease as much as adults. And for whatever reason, COVID-19 appears to be a disease where we need to be most worried about adults in the workplace rather than children. So that advice has been consistent. And I think it's how each individual state and territory uh, applies that that's most important. Remembering that if you live in New South Wales, you need to look at what the New South Wales Education Minister and Premier are saying. Similar um, for South Australia, look at your South Australian Education Minister and Premier because they're the people uh, that are making decisions about your child's education. Just to be clear though, Nick Coatesworth, you are saying that your message has been consistent all along, but as of April 16, the AHPPC's advice 
was that students should practice social distancing. That created a whole set of circumstances for every educational institution in the, in the country. And then, most recently, on April 24, that advice has changed, saying that that social distancing is no longer required. So we've said that there are different things, Hamish. I think that the advice that schools are safe places has been consistent. The advice that uh, social distancing uh, is not entirely necessary and is also somewhat impractical uh, to implement, particularly for younger children, that is updated advice uh, from the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee. And so uh, it's important not to uh, give the impression of confusion, rather we are updating the advice based on uh, the latest evidence. And we know now from New South Wales uh, their studies in particular, where they've had uh, some 18 children infected, uh, nine children and nine teachers with COVID-19, that it has not tended uh, to spread within those schools. So the advice regarding the safety of schools certainly has stayed the same. The advice regarding what we practically do to make schools safer places has developed. Uh, Leanne Davies, is it all clear and consistent from your perspective? Um, that's a challenging one. I do think it depends on which state you're in. Um, certainly, being based in Victoria, I felt that the message we had in Victoria was very clear. Uh, we were given a very precise timeline and told that at the end of um, Term 2, we would be continuing our remote learning until then. So I felt fairly confident in what we were planning for. But you only have to watch the news and to look at the stories that are coming out in the media. There are many different messages, I think, that are being um, communicated. They're not all all coming from um, medical experts, but there's lots of mixed messages out there about what's going on. But hold on, even in your state where there was a clear message about Term 2 being remote learning, the Chief Health mm. Officer, Brett Sutton, is now saying it will only at this stage be at least until May 11, when Victoria's state of emergency lapses. It appears that maybe uh, school face-to-face -face learning may return earlier than the end of Term 2. Potentially, but we're still waiting for it for that advice. As principals, we've been sent a lot of communication um, that has told us to plan until the end of term two and to ensure that we are able to do that. Uh, we were told that that would be revisited as the medical advice um, unfolds and that medical information unfolds. Um, but for now, as far as I'm concerned, we plan for term two. Um, that's been fairly consistent. Um, but it's just an unfolding situation. We really don't know how this is going to transpire. Mark Scott, can you understand why so many people are confused? Well, it's been moving quickly, Hamish, and I think that's one of the attributes of COVID-19. Things move very quickly on you. It's worth thinking back five weeks here in New South Wales. In Within a one-week period, we moved from 17% of children staying home to 41% of children staying home. And at that time, we were having 200, up to 200 new cases in New South Wales diagnosed every day. Well, this morning it was two. Last week there were days there was only five or six new cases, a dramatic transformation. And so I think, you know, four or five weeks ago, we may have all thought that term two and term three would have been periods where children could stay at home. Now we think we can do a lot better than that with the remarkable public adherence to the rules around social distancing. We think there's a good chance of getting our kids back into school this term. We're going to bring them back from the beginning of week three. Lisa, I want to bring you in here because Asher has a specific situation. He needs early education Auslan teaching. And his mother mm. has told us that she's actually concerned for his, his brain development, that without, at this early age, he's three, uh, having that face-to-face -face learning, it's actually going to be hindered for the rest of his life. Well, we know that uh, COVID-19 doesn't hit young people and children as much as it does. We didn't have the evidence until fairly recently. It's a good thing to get children back in school. The public health advice has been consistently to have children in school. And I think it's time that we had pragmatic discussions about what that means for children uh, such as young Asher and his parents and his family and other kids like him. Um, early should, brain should they override the, the bigger health question? It's not overriding the bigger health question, it's following the bigger health question. If the bigger health question and if the advice coming from the authorities says it's fine for children to go back to school, then that should occur. That should happen, it should happen straight away. Because we know that early development of a child in school with literacy and with learning, no matter what language it is, um, is critically important. It'll affect them for the rest of their lives. And this is... Um, 
an incident that's been ongoing now for some months. It's unlikely that we're going to be out of a COVID type response for some time yet. So this is not something that's going to be over in a week or two. This may well be something that might be over towards the end of the year with bumps uh, throughout next year. So the earlier we get kids back into school, we can watch it carefully. You know, we've got the facilities to be able to do that and deal with it. Our next question is from Madeleine Webber in Maruka, Queensland. Considering the political football that the topic of schools has become in the past few weeks, I would like to ask, in consideration of the safety of students and staff, what conditions will need to be met in order for schools to return to the physical classroom? And secondly, will there be any special consideration given to Year 12s in returning to school, given the fact that Year 12s in Queensland are engaging in the external exams and receiving an ATAR score for the first time? Lisa, this is the question that almost every Year 12 student has. How on earth am I going to get into university yeah. when I don't know how I'm going to finish my final year at school? Please keep working. Um, your teachers have been working hard with you. You've been working hard for a long, long time. You've got dreams and expectations. Every single university in this country has been working hard to try and work through pathways. Now, we've always had good pathways for entry into school, uh, into university for school students who have experienced some sort of disadvantage, some sort of catastrophe or some sort of adverse events. And this is no different. All of us have got plans in place. All of us have already got existing pathways and they will be invoked. So, so what's it going to look like, though? Are you going to rely on an ATAR or are you going to rely on... <laughs> All sorts of other factors yeah. to determine we're, who gets yeah. in. We're going to be relying on all sorts of other factors okay. and the ATAR. So, so right, in the, the in ATAR the, is important. You got into university without an HSC, didn't you? I did. I did. I got into university without finishing school. I came in through a, a dedicated pathway um, and I'm very pleased that, that that occurred. Many people do go to university um, without going through high school. I came in as a mature age student. I was well over 21 years of age uh, and I basically fell in love with education and have pretty much will remain in it ever since. So um, there are opportunities, there are options, but for students now the key is, is to remain studying and working hard. Uh, uh, Nick Coatesworth, the question also included uh, uh, some detail about the consideration of safety for students and staff. What are the conditions that are going to enable all of our schools to reopen? Because as much as you say the medical advice is clear and consistent, schools, probably the majority of schools in Australia, are not open for face-to-face -face learning for the bulk of students right now. Yeah. Well, the, the conditions are, are many and varied, but at, at the simplest, we need to have epidemic control in Australia and a very low number of cases, and that's what we've achieved. And I, I really echo Mark's comment. One of the reasons things have changed so quickly is because the country, Australians, have been so good at getting this under control. So that's the first precondition. I think the second one is the growing amount of evidence that children themselves uh, seem to be less often affected. We know that, uh, that around about just over 200 of our some 6,700 cases have been children under 18 years. That is a very small percent percentage relative to the population size of, uh, of children in Australia. So that's the second condition. But the third one's the most important. And that is that we have to have confidence, confidence from our, for our parents and our teachers, as well as our students, that a school is going to be a safe place to be. And I think what we're seeing now in Australia is, is growing confidence, growing confidence for state health departments to make plans uh, towards this, but also growing confidence amongst parents and teachers as we see the effort we've made to control the epidemic. That is so important, that trust and confidence element. All right, our next question tonight is from John Bowden in South Yarra, Victoria. My question is to Nick Coatesworth. I'd like to know how you can say it's safe to go back to school when New Zealand's largest hotspot was at Marist College in Auckland. So this school was a, a girls' secondary school. I think something like 93 cases of COVID-19 uh, were recorded uh, or linked at least to that one school, Nick. Well, John, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I mean, I don't know uh, the circumstances of that. I, I am led to believe that there was a particular school cluster in New Zealand that was related to a very large uh, 
cultural celebration uh, or a, a, a sort of mass gathering within the school, that may have been the one. The data that we have to go on is the data that we've seen in Australia and, and most particularly, I'm, I know Mark will speak to this, but the recent data out of New South Wales uh, that has shown that um, with 800, uh, some 863 close contacts of those COVID-19 uh, uh, children and staff in New South Wales, there were only two, two cases of COVID-19 from, uh, from the resulted. Now that's a really important statistic. That's the data that we've got to go on. And it's data that's backed up by uh, evidence and research from around the world. So I think the bulk of the evidence uh, says that schools are safe. Mark Scott, the criticism of this report that has been released from New South mm. Wales is that it was a relatively small sample at a time when a lot of people had already taken their, their kids out of schools anyway. Yeah, not quite right, Hamish. One of the reasons it's a small sample was that it was noteworthy how few students and how few uh, members of teaching staff actually developed COVID-19 when the curve was growing very quickly in New South Wales. We had really very few cases, given the number of cases there were in the broader community. And certainly the first of those cases emerged when our schools were fully operational. So we had a student or a teacher and the Department of Health identified 50 or 60 people who were close contacts. And in total, um, as Nick said, more than 850 close contacts. They were all um, tested and then uh, checked over a 14-day period. And it was very noteworthy that only two of them developed COVID-19. And look, it, it's, that research is yet to be peer-reviewed, but it was a confidence builder because it, it also reconciles with the research that's been done out of Wuhan, out of Iceland, out of the Netherlands, and the broader research that's come to bear that says children do not appear to be uh, strong uh, transmitters of COVID-19 and um, children do not appear to uh, give COVID-19 to adults in any significant numbers. And so that's encouraging. And it's also very different to the pattern of, say, something like influenza, where children are super spreaders of the disease. But it's not just about the children, though, isn't it? It's no. about the fact that when you reopen a school, you reopen a significant part of a community. And yes. you don't just get the yeah. children moving around, Leanne. You get the parents, you get the teachers, yep, you get absolutely. grandparents, you, you get all of the people that mm. need to facilitate this. There is a risk, isn't there? Yeah, I think so. I think there's there's a risk in everything. And um, I would have to disagree that there's growing confidence. I think we've got a little way to go to build some of that confidence. Uh, we still have lots of teachers and lots of educators questioning um, not just that study that you've mentioned. Yes, some people are questioning that study as they're saying that there are other studies from other countries uh, with contradictory information. Um, so the, the conversation has to be more rigorous. I think there has to be more facts put out there um, and more discussion to be had in order to build that confidence. In order for teachers to feel confident coming into school, they need to know that their health and welfare is being thought of as well. We are all there for the students and we are absolutely delighted that this does not seem to impact impact students in the way it's impacting adults. Uh, but we do have to take into consideration that the schools function because of those adults and some of them are very vulnerable. So we must take that into account. The educators are, all of the teachers are working incredibly hard um, to make sure that uh, learning will happen in any way possible, but they need to feel safe and comfortable in their working environment. Uh, I, I think that's right, Hamish, and that's why in New South Wales we're talking about a measured steady return over a couple of weeks. I, I think you could see the parental concern when children were so quickly taken out of school. I think our teachers do want reassurance and, and I think our teachers will listen to the health experts. So that they'll want but to but know... But you are hearing the concern from the teachers themselves. Yeah. I mean, we have been inundated yeah. with teachers mm. talking about how scared they are. Do you hear that, Leanne, at your school in Victoria? Yeah. Absolutely. There's lots of conversations and lots of very vulnerable people. Um, there was certainly a lot of conversations around a study from Iceland that had come out that showed that um, young people over the age of 10 were actually showing similar infection rates to adults. And so when you, you start to have conversations about those sorts of things happening, teachers do become concerned. This is their workplace. They need to know what's going on. And you see then exactly what's going on in New Zealand with that cluster school at Marist. It's a conversation that we have to address. We are are working on our information but we do need to do further studies because we're in such an early stage of this it's, it's very difficult to know how it's going to unfold. 
So, so there's health advice that's been provided that we need to follow and part of that is social distancing with teachers mm. and uh, members of staff to, to have space for them. You know, we're looking to provide sanitizer in classrooms and to wipe down classrooms to provide uh, extra cleaning support. So there is good advice. But I also think we need to um, bow to the expertise of the real experts in the field. You know, all summer when we were surrounded by bushfires and smoke, the debate was we've got to listen to the experts and respect their expertise. Now, we have clear experts uh, in immunology. We have clear experts in epidemics. They have gathered together. They are studying the research from around the world. I think we need to listen carefully to their advice that schools are safe and then think, well, how do we build the confidence of our parents and how do we build the confidence of our teachers that schools are safe for the entire school community? To be fair, though, the experts that you refer to are not entirely on the same page. In the state that Leanne is in, the Chief Medical Officer has been saying that he doesn't believe keeping schools open uh, immediately is consistent with the broader message of people staying at home. But, but well, that, I think... that's not entirely true, uh, Hamish. I, I think... Uh, Dr Sutton clearly uh, tweeted uh, that uh, schools were safe places. The concern is the mobility that opening schools might engender within the population. But the po I think the and, important and thing to recognise... And do share concern, Nick Coatesworth, about the broader mobility that comes with reopening schools? I, I think that society has to get back on its feet and getting back on its feet means increased mobility but it means increased mobility with an attention to physical distancing where we're controlling pick up and drop off where we're limiting contact between adults in the school environment you know we we are acutely aware i i understand the concerns and the fears of teachers and i understand them because they are the same concerns and fears that i've had amongst my colleagues um, doctors and nurses who we've been um, talking to for the past several months and um, it's important that we present the evidence in a way that, that is um, clearly accessible but that evidence at the moment demonstrates that schools are safe places and, and I'm, the Chief Health Officer of Victoria does agree with us on that. OK. Well, as Mark Scott just mentioned, students in Australia's largest school system, New South Wales, uh, head back to school online this week and they'll slowly phase in face-to-face -face learning from May 11. So to understand just how complicated that is going to be, I visited, at a safe distance, Cumberland High School in Sydney's northwest. My name is Michelle Picoulis. I'm the principal of Cumberland High School. What's it like running a high school during a pandemic? It's been, without a doubt, the greatest challenge of my career. I've been in teaching now for 26 years and it's been quite devastating. Walking the corridors, empty corridors without students, really, really difficult because the whole joy of teaching is that interaction. It's just not the same having the kids around you, engaging, learning, interacting, the joy. And that's certainly been very difficult. Hi, I'm Pervi Kapoor, I'm 17 years old and I'm in Year 12. I'm Rowan Chait, I'm also 17 years old and also in Year 12. For the six years we've been in high school, you know, we've been told it's all in build up to the HSC and then suddenly we're told that our HSC is being threatened by this virus. I wouldn't really call it homeschooling because at least in homeschooling you're still being taught in person. Sometimes you get connection issues in online classes that mean half the lesson's over before you even start anything. We don't know what the HSC is going to look like. Sometimes the government's like, oh yeah, we'll cut down your syllabus or we'll take marks from year 11. Sometimes they're like, we'll repeat it. And we're constantly getting all this new information. But for us, this is it. Like, you know, this is like our whole world. So <laughs> we don't really know how we're going to like carry on, how to go forward. Have, have there been tears? Yeah, there's been a, like a little bit of tears. It's embarrassing, but it's true. You realise that you're not going to experience this again. When that's being taken away from you as well, it's sad. There's a plan to get students back into classrooms next term in your state. What do you make of it? If you're coming to school, if you're putting yourself at more risk of becoming infected, um, then what's the point of that if you're just going to keep doing online learning? I honestly don't understand the point of it, with all due respect. Where they think that coming into school one day might help us, we don't think the same way because we don't really see the actual benefit from it schools will be going back to some form of face-to-face -face learning. What does that mean? 
For me, in practical terms, in looking at the logistics, that would mean 14 classes at school on a particular given day, 10 students in each classroom, approximately 34 teachers, 33.6 teachers, to manage or supervise the 14 classes. Plus 14 teachers would be teaching 10 of their students, 24 kids on average in each classroom. How do I choose which 10 kids stay with their classroom teacher and then the other 10 and the other four moving to a different classroom who will still be doing the online learning with the actual teacher two classrooms down, how is that going to work? I've got to say this sounds crazy. It's hard. It's hard. There's been different views from different states, different views from the federal government. That's where the confusion is, absolutely. And the mixed messaging that does impact the community profoundly because it's already difficult. We've never had to deal with a pandemic, so it's understandable that there would be confusion. We're all scrambling to make it work, so we're going to have to find a solution, and we will. I'm determined we will. You must understand that that's terrifying for them. Absolutely, but they have us. Hamish, they have the school, they have all of us, and they know whatever happens, we will get them over the line. Mark Scott, you described it as an orderly return to face-to-face -to -face teaching. When yeah. you hear it yeah. spelt out like that, it doesn't sound anything like orderly. It sounds pretty crazy. Yeah. I, I suppose I'm just drawing the difference, Hamish, between just opening our school doors tomorrow and trying to encourage or think that all the students will flood in. There are parental concerns, as we've heard. There are teacher concerns. But what we have felt so important is that we need to get an opportunity to get every child back into school every week. I was very concerned, so was the Minister and the Premier, about the prospect that some of our children who will already miss five weeks of school could go seven, eight, ten weeks without stepping foot in a classroom. And we have a view in our system that every student is known, valued and cared for. And so we thought a system that even, even though it's a battle and you've got to back Michelle in, she is an outstanding leader and as she said, she'll get the job done. But we wanted to see every child to have the ability to go to school mm. at least one day a week. Would it not have been simpler to bring Year 12s back first? Well, I think um, every student's important, Hamish. And those Year 12 students, uh, they are working hard and I know that every school that I've spoken to is looking to bring students in one day a week and then they're working very hard to provide extra special opportunities for Year 12 students. But I worry about the Year 8 student, Hamish, or the Year 9 student. For them to miss a term of school, well, they may not even get an opportunity to do an HSC on the back of that. We have a commitment to every child and to say these students can go back but these students can have weeks out of this classroom. I don't think that's a fair thing across the, across the system. We have 13 years of schooling. We think every one of those students deserves an opportunity to be able to come back to school. I want to bring in the New South Wales Teachers Federation President, Angelo Gavrilatos, who's on the line via Skype. Quite simply, as you heard the explanation there from one school principal, can this be done? Well, thanks very much, Hamish. And, and first of all, um, my deepest admiration, my deepest admiration for our teachers and principals who have been tearing themselves and turning themselves inside out in order to try and provide some educational continuity for our kids. We have deep concerns for our teachers and principals who are struggling under the weight, as uh, the principal just said, under the weight of contradictory statements, under the weight of political announcements that have little understanding, let alone comprehension of the complexity of how schools are managed and organised. Our teachers and principals have done a remarkable job. One of the things that's concerned us, and I've been listening to the program uh, this evening, is that a lot of discussion rightly focuses on whether schools are safe for kids. And that's an important focus for us all. Teachers are often an afterthought in this discussion when it comes to their health and safety. It needs to be remembered that our schools are not only populated by kids, we have schools where there are more than 200 teachers uh, on site. And we're very concerned about their health and safety needs and, of course, their professional needs. From the outset, Hamish, throughout this crisis, what's driven us, what's motivated us, is only one thing, and that's the health and safety of our kids, the health and safety of our teachers and principals, and indeed our entire school communities. I just want to hear from, from Leanne as to whether that's the, the concern shared at your school as well. Uh, I think it absolutely rings true. I mean, we've we've been very, very careful with the discussions that we've had with staff, and we've made it very clear that we wanted to hear their concerns from the beginning um, so that we could make sure that what we were doing was... Um, 
making sure we had a fair roster for any staff who needed to come on site. We had those discussions with those staff. We're still in discussions with what we're planning for when we do return to school. And then we have all of those staff working from home who also need additional support because they have their own children and their own families and they're trying to homeschool them whilst at the same time teaching their classes here at school. So the logistics are so incredibly challenging. Um, I think every school will have its own unique situation, uh, but hats off. I mean, the teachers have been incredibly resilient and what they're trying to do is the very, very best for their students. Uh, Angelo, I, I need to put a question question back to you because we've had a number of questions along these lines. This is from Steve in Victoria. He says, why are teachers any different to any other group? Uh, how would it be if the checkout person, the cleaner, doctor, nurse decided they didn't want to go to work? Uh, all of these groups have staff rooms, so don't use that excuse. Well, first of all, um Let's acknowledge, as we all as we all should, our nurses and doctors about the, the wonderful work that they're doing. They are absolutely on the front line. I think teaching is a bit different because what we see in any one work site, a school, is in some instances 200 or more adults congregating together. I think it's a bit different from what we see at the supermarket, for example, where the social distancing uh, practices that they've put in place are quite remarkable, including, in fact, now perspex protectors in front of those serving at each uh, checkout. Schools are very different. Levels of interaction are very different. And we're talking about a lot of people on one side at any one time. There's also the contradictions here, Hamish, the contradictions yeah. with respect to the application of social distancing principles. We've been told that kids, for example, are not allowed to play in a public playground, yet when it comes to a school playground literally divided by a fence, somehow it's OK. We're told, teachers, for example, students should not be looked after, children should not be looked after by their grandparents, but then again we're told that it's OK to be taught by someone else's grandparents. These contradictions weigh heavily on teachers and the circumstances are certainly different from other occupations. Nick Coatsworth, I can see you try to get in there. Well, Hamish, I, one of the contradictions in Mr Gavrilatos' argument there is that Australians have been able to turn round this epidemic curve in a matter of weeks and, and yet Angelo is, is suggesting that uh, parents can't so appropriately physically distance at pick-up. I mean, that, that does not make a lot of sense to me. And the sort of selective um, cherry-picking of things like uh, the public versus the school playgrounds. We've been very clear at the AHPPC that the reason that it's OK to have uh, playgrounds in school is because you can clean them, because you can regulate them, because you can make them a safer place. And if there are schools that have public access playgrounds, we're absolutely clear on that. They shouldn't the children shouldn't be allowed there. Um, the contradiction that he mentioned about the grandparents, it's never been about grandparents themselves. It's about the age of the teacher and the potential conditions that they might have that render them a vulnerable worker in the workplace. And it's it, our advice has been clear. Like any workplace, whether you're a nurse or a doctor or a teacher, if you're a vulnerable person in the workplace, um, you must be found alternative duties that, don't in, that involve you being at home. And, and as Angelo well knows, when we've had staff who have um, had uh, health conditions, medical conditions that have, have uh, identified them as high risk, we've immediately enabled them to be able to work from home. We do appreciate, we need to build the confidence of our staff to bring them back, but we have clear health advice on how to do that and they're the policies and processes that we're beginning to roll out now as we look to receive children back in schools from the beginning of week three. All right, our next question tonight is from Gabe Joseph in Bondi Junction. School is going back this week in New South Wales and I am a year 12 student. I go to a public school, which means I will only return to school for face-to-face -face learning for one day a week from week three. Yet there are many private schools across the state that will resume full-time face-to-face learning from week one, making the situation grossly unfair and inequitable. What is the government doing to even the playing field between public schools and independent schools, considering the HSE exams and trial exams have not been postponed to allow for these discrepancies? Uh, Angelo Gavrilatis, can something be done? Well, we certainly hope so. This is the HSC year, the year 12 year. It is a high stakes year. And those contradictions that were described by that student very, uh, uh, very eloquently 
are the direct consequence of the announcement of the New South Wales government with respect to its return to school program. Let me make it very clear, Hamish, we've always supported a return to school program. We're on the record of uh, and have demonstrated our, our willingness to engage with the government to see a orderly, staggered return to school. In fact, as Mark knows, more than three weeks ago, we started those, those discussions. Unfortunately, the, the announcement made by the Premier of New South Wales failed to take into consideration the effect that was described to you. I'd like school... us just to focus on that question, though. Lisa, is there something that you think could be done to make sure that students, regardless of which system they're in, have, a, have an even chance of getting into university next year? It's critically important, isn't it? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's really about equity for us. And having the various pathways that are available and taking into consideration the various circumstances that the stu mm. students face during this year. And also students... Can, can you acknowledge that there's sort of two streams here, that the private schools probably are going back to face-to-face -to -face learning yes. much faster than it's, the public system. I can't imagine why it wouldn't have an effect. Of course it's going to have an effect. But can and universities recognise that in yes. how they make these decisions about who gets in? Absolutely. Um, with a lot of our uh, entry programs and our pathways programs, uh, we go through each student application case by case. And I've sat on panels. We have spent days and days and days going through such things. Mm. There are mechanisms for us to do it and we're adaptable. We're flexible and we're able to do it. And, and every nice school stuff. principal that I've spoken to is working very hard to get HSC students in as much as possible. But if, if you listen to Hamish and you, uh, if you listen to Angelo and just let Year 12 in, you're really making a decision uh, to keep all the other years out. And that's something we reject. We think it's important that the Year 8, Year 9, Year 10 children are able to go as well as the Year 12 students in coming weeks. All right. Angelo, Hamish. thanks very much for... for being with us tonight. We'll leave you there. And our next question tonight comes from Carla Owen in Melbourne. I am a high school teacher and I've been following all the conflicting information about schools in the media. Parliament originally stated that they were to sit in August, but this has now been brought forward to mid-May. Part of the reason for this was due to issues surrounding social distancing, but ScoMo has said all along that schools are a safe place to be. What makes parliamentarians more important than me? They can social distance more easily than I can, and they probably will, but in schools this is certainly not the case. When Mr Morrison came out last week and essentially berated and devalued teachers, this was a slap in the face to all teachers. Why is Mr Morrison putting teachers, one of the country's most important resources, in harm's way? Why are we so expendable? All right, well, I'm going to put this question to the Federal Education Minister, Dan Tian, who joins us now from his office uh, in his electorate of Hamilton in Victoria. And I should note you are live. The backdrop, though, uh, in your office is not. How do you respond to that question from Carla Owen? Uh, can I say to you, Carla... Um, the federal government and all state and territory governments have been very conscious about the health and welfare of teachers and principals and teachers' aides right across this nation. Uh, both my sisters are, are teachers. So this is something that we have paid attention to and given great consideration to. But what we've done consistently right throughout this pandemic has taken the advice of the medical expert panel. Now, that medical expert panel is made up of the chief medical officers from all state and territories and the Commonwealth chief medical officer. And that advice has been consistent right throughout this pandemic, that it's been safe for students to go to school and with the right protocols in place, it can, it's safe for teachers to go to school and, and teach students. And that's why it's been the consistent approach that the federal government has taken right throughout this pandemic and it will continue to be. And if that advice changes, we'll change our position. But while that advice remains the same, but then we want respect, to do everything we respect, can Minister, to the, encourage... The Prime Minister, though, has been appealing directly to teachers, saying to them on the 15th of April, these children need you for our schools to remain open. But you know very well it's not the individual teacher's decision about whether to open the school, it's the State Premier or the Territory Chief Minister. This has caused immense frustration and confusion. 
Well, Hamish, in the Northern Territory, the teachers have been going to school right up till the end of Term 1, and they've started again um, this term as well. In South Australia, schools open there again but, today. But Carla Rowan, with respect, in is, in, is in Melbourne teaching. in Victoria, your home state, where there is different guidance from the state government, uh, and it's created an enormous amount of dismay from what we can tell from all of the teachers that have written to us because on the one hand the Prime Minister is saying one thing, you're saying the same thing and then their state government is saying another thing altogether. Well, what we've been doing right through this pandemic is taking a very consistent approach, and that's following the advice of the medical experts. And when the Prime Minister was talking, he was speaking to teachers right across the nation, and he was praising those teachers who are teaching our children. Some are doing it online. Others are doing it in the classroom. And that's, he was reaching out to them directly and thanking them for the role they're playing and also expressing his view that they're going to play still an important role as we continue to deal with this pandemic, that we're going to need them to be providing that continuity of education. And that's what we're asking all teachers right across the country to do. And we understand that teachers are playing different roles depending on state and territory government policies. But what we wanted to do and what the Prime Minister was very keen to do was to reach out to all teachers to say thank you and just show that he understood the important role that they're playing. The next day, though, the Prime Minister, on the 16th of April, came out and said that parents should follow the instructions of the state premiers and their state education ministers, that if you lived in Victoria, there's only one person to listen to, that's the Premier of Victoria. But then subsequent to that, You've been out in public as recently as last night, urging all schools to be open. Peter Dutton has been saying that any state that's not, or that Queensland, because they're not uh, putting their schools back uh, in, in place right now, that they're uh, under, the, under the pressure of the unions. Do you recognise that that creates inconsistency in the message? Well, what we've been saying is that we think that every state and territory should aim to set a goal, and that goal should be to have all students back in the classroom with teachers teaching in the classroom uh, by the end of May. And we think that that would be a terrific national goal for us to be able to achieve. If we've been able to flatten the curve, plus keep that continuity of education going, we think as a nation we will have achieved something that very few other countries have been able to achieve. And the reason why we're putting that case is because we know that if we don't have the schools open, children in the schools, teachers teaching in the classroom, that parents, some parents will have to make the choice between going to work or staying and supervising their children while they're learning and also that those children from low socioeconomic backgrounds, from Indigenous backgrounds, from rural and remote backgrounds, those students where English is a second language in the home, they're the ones who will miss sure. out the most from uh, not being and we have at school, not having that connection with school. We have explored that issue on this program tonight. But last week, Peter Dutton tweeted saying that Queensland kids should be back at school and the only reason they're not is because the Premier is running scared of the militant QTU. That is simply not true, is it? Well, um, Peter Dutton is very passionate about wanting to get children back into the into He might the be classroom. passionate, but that, that's and just not, not, doing... not true, is it? Well, that's the, a view that he, he has put. Now, obviously, the Queensland Education Minister has put a, put a different view. It's a democracy. They both live in Queensland. They're passionate about the education system there and they're able to have a discussion like that, as we should. That's what political debates are all about. But what so, we so have So it's been an opinion, it's not a fact. Is that, is that what you're saying? It's an opinion, not a fact? Well, it, what, what we're seeing is that they're having a debate about what they think are the reasons why we aren't seeing uh, children and teachers back in the classroom at Queensland at this stage. Now, there will be various views and they're happy to have that discussion and that debate, and as they should, both passionate Queenslanders. All right, our next question tonight uh, for you, Minister, is from Alison Barnes in Brunswick East in Victoria.
I'm a university lecturer and president of the National Tertiary Education Union. My question is for the Education Minister. Minister, universities are projected to lose $5 billion and 21,000 of us are looking at losing work. The, the package that you released on Easter Sunday goes nowhere near to meeting the needs of the sector and we are ineligible for JobKeeper. Why won't you support our universities given the central role that they will play in reskilling the Australian workforce and educating our kids? How do you respond to that, Minister? Uh, well, first of all, Alison, I would say uh, that I'd like to thank all universities for the role that they've played in helping us deal with their, this pandemic. Uh, you've seen uh, professors at Melbourne University uh, with the Doherty Institute uh, providing crucial advice to the government about dealing with this pandemic. We've seen in Queensland University researchers there um, on the pursuit of a vaccine and making progress. We've seen all our research talent being put to use to help us deal with this pandemic and I think our universities need to be recognised for the contribution they've made. What I announced on, on Easter Sunday was that we would guarantee the higher education sector in, our, in Australia, our universities, over $18.5 billion in funding for this year, putting a ballast uh, into their finances. That was the number one request that the universities put to me that they wanted that certainty of that provision of that money. Uh, that is what we've provided to them. It doesn't matter what happens to the student, the domestic student load this year. Uh, they will get that 18.5 billion dollars. We also put in place um, some short courses for the first time, micro credential courses. Uh, what we're doing is leading the way uh, when it comes to putting in place these short courses, so our universities can help reskill those who have had their lives turned upside down, and that will give the opportunity again for our universities to expand their offerings during this pandemic. And I look forward to continue to working with our university sector as we deal with this pandemic. Why, though, did the federal government, though, uh, change the arrangements for universities in terms of accessing uh, the JobKeeper supplement so that universities would need to include Commonwealth grant scheme funding in their turnover in order to be considered for that, effectively ruling many universities uh, out of the JobKeeper program? Well, the, the reason why we wanted that $18.5 billion of revenue taken into account is because we think that that's a fair way to assess the revenue of universities. Uh, obviously, we made uh, an exemption for charities, those, those organisations who are out there uh, obviously providing food to those who need it, clothing for those who need it, uh, money for those who need it during this pandemic. But we thought universities should um, face the same requirements of those of large businesses if they're over a billion dollars or, or those businesses who are under a billion dollars. So 30% revenue drop if a university is under a billion, 50% revenue drop if the revenue of a university is over a billion dollars. Dan Tien, appreciate your time tonight. Let me turn over to uh, Lisa jackson Pulver here. I mean, there are real-world consequences for universities because of that decision. What are they? Oh, boy, it goes a long way. Um, ultimately, the university sector in Australia is a, a, a public good. It's a public sector. Um, we do not have shareholders. Um, we are owned by the people of this nation. Uh, and we have been provisioning education as part of the tertiary sector for a long, long time. We grow the doctors, the nurses, the teachers. Uh, we have a very robust um, research sector and a very strong education sector. To have us in the type of strife that we're in at the moment will have consequences for how we consider ourselves to be a clever country mm. and for how we consider ultimate, ultimately generations of people to come in what we need to do to maintain our strength in education, research and the academic but can, ability. Just to help people at home understand, though, that decision that Dan Tien was referring to there, does it effectively mean that universities are being treated not the same way as other not-for-profits but, in fact, as, as a big business? Yeah, and, and it's interesting that that's the case. We're grateful for the assistance. We're grateful for the dialogue that we have with the government. It's critically important. They are, in fact, you know, very important uh, partners of us, as are the Australian people. 
Uh, we are a sovereign asset of this nation. Um, we are very, very different uh, to a big business. Um, we don't rely on funding in the same way as big businesses. We don't have shareholders that we pay benefits to. Uh, the benefit of our work is exemplary research, <laughs> educated people and a strong nation. Mark, Mark Scott, are you surprised that universities are being treated in that way? Because they, it would seem from what the union is saying that there is going to be significant job losses as a result of it. Yeah, and, and it's just um, so important to the social fabric and the economic foundation of the country. But also, this is a vital export industry as well. We have half a million uh, international students here who have no source of income. They've probably lost their jobs. What they are saying back to their families back home about their Australian experience, uh, you know, heaven only knows. And the prospect of bringing in next year's class of international students is going to be very difficult for the universities. I am, I'm always astounded that the university sector does not have, get the attention that we see to the mining sector or we've seen to the tourism sector around uh, Virgin, if you, if you like. This is a vital industry, uh, important uh, all across the country, important to the future of the nation, and it really is facing very significant threat now and attention must be paid. Our next question tonight comes from Charles Chin in North Melbourne. 30 years ago, when I arrived in Australia, our cities were a shadow of what they are now, or that is, until COVID-19. Streets were empty after dark, and the shops closed at lunchtime on Saturdays. International students, in particular, have brought life to our cities and kept our universities afloat. They work in businesses, they spend money, travel and dine out, and are an essential part of our fabric. Can Australia afford not to support our international students financially during the pandemic? Nick Coatsworth, I want to put this to you. Well, I think, Hamish, what, what the question shows is that you, you can... Two things can happen with COVID-19. Either you can have significant mortality from it and you can overwhelm your health system, or the effects that it has on your society through your restrictions can be so um, damaging uh, that it really impacts on important sectors, important members of our community. We've spoken about schools, we've spoken about education. And I think the answer to all these questions is that when we've got a very low prevalence of COVID-19 in, in our community, it is time to start opening things up again. Um, schools, let's see how that goes in a staged and staggered fashion. Then we can move and consider other aspects of our economy. We can consider universities. I can't speak directly um, to financial assistance for international students, but I certainly think that it exemplifies the need for us to capitalise on the great work that Australians have done and start to move ourselves forward back to the new normal that is living with COVID-19. Leanne, you've worked in education in multiple markets around the world. Can you see yeah. when you come here to Australia the value of the international student market? I think you've got value of international students everywhere. Um, it shapes your culture, it changes what goes on round about you and it's very good and influential for our home students and our international students to have that sharing of um, experiences. So I think every country benefits from that. The, the counterpoint though, Lisa, is that many students studying in Year 12 at the moment are being told, look, you might have a better chance of getting into some of the courses you want because you're not going to have the same level of competition this year that you might otherwise have. Yeah, I don't know if that's quite true. Um, the international students um, are um, funded differently in our university sector. We have enough room for the domestic students that we're able to take through our CSB places. Um, the reality is, is that we want students to work really, really hard, domestic students to work really hard and come to us um, next year. Um, just on that um, matter of international students, there's around about 247,000 jobs that international students create by virtue of them being here outside of the tertiary ed sector. Um, $1.98 billion is the worth to just the New South Wales economy alone of the international students here. So this is a, a meaningful conversation. It's absolutely material to not just the economy of the university and tertiary education sector, but to that actually of our Commonwealth. All right. Our next question is from Amy Phillips in Oran Park. There have been millions of dollars worth of resources, both physical and human, that have gone into supporting teachers during the COVID-19 period. 
Beyond this time, does the panel expect teaching and learning in Australia to change as a result of this and for the better? Will we see, for example, a better use of technology in education, increased approaches to how we tackle professional learning, and perhaps even a systematic review to elements such as the HSC? Uh, Leanne. Yes. Oh, this, this question excites me. I certainly hope we see some changes. Um, if, if there's a better time to have a conversation, I don't know when it is. I think there's so much that we can do in education to really look at what we've been doing, look at what our normal was, and look at what it can be when we start to return back into education. There are so many things that we can look to review and improve. Um, there's many different ways to tackle education. There's ways to be more flexible. And I think there are some students who may be finding this type of remote learning challenging, but I've definitely heard stories of some students who are actually finding it um, incredibly inspiring and they're interacting and engaging with it in different ways and they're starting to think for themselves in different ways that they can be become creative in their learning, which is fantastic. That's what we want. We want our students to start communicating what they've enjoyed and what they've got out of this. I mean, our teachers have been absolutely brilliant the work that they did to prepare this remote learning so quickly, the way they've embraced technology, mm. the way that they've enthusiastically taken on the challenge, I think has been absolutely remarkable. And most of them have said to me they haven't learnt so much, the teachers, in such yeah. a short period of time in their entire careers. And now I think we think through how we can continue to use that technology. We think through what work can students best do on their own at home, what is the classroom environment best utilised for, how we can rethink professional development and how we can rethink this enormous uh, technology network that we've laid down just in these recent weeks. I think it is encouraging and exciting. Nick Coatesworth, I know you've been homeschooling some of your three children in recent weeks. Uh, I suspect you'll be happy uh, once they're back in a classroom. Well, Hamish, uh, my wife's a doctor and, and I'm the DCMO at the moment. We uh, tried very hard to do exactly what the ACT government wanted of us, which was to keep the kids at home and rearrange our schedules so that we could homeschool them for the last uh, two and a half weeks of term. But we uh, we have asked for them to go back for three days a week. And, uh, you, you know, they're primary school children. I think a lot of what Leanne was talking about applies to uh, senior school children, I'm, I'm afraid. I think, I think my kids need the interaction of the classroom. I think, I think they're suffering without it and I worry that, that if that's happening to my kids, there must be a whole swathe of children out there who are in the same sort of um, position. So whilst I completely agree, um, it's a great opportunity to learn for these great online techniques. They're not a sustainable solution as far as I can see. And certainly we are in a position now where we can, uh, we can move towards getting kids back in the classroom and, and uh, that's where I think the kids need to be. OK, well, finally tonight, I want to update you on the story of Farhad Bandesh, a Kurdish refugee who, you may remember, asked a question on our program last week. We locked up at the Mantra Hotel uh, on the third floor. Every 24 hours there are around 60 staff changes. It is impossible to practice uh, social distancing. Uh, this puts us at the high risk uh, catching COVID-19. Well, on Thursday night, a few days after he asked that question on this program, Farhad was moved to a detention facility in Melbourne's north. A spokesperson from the Australian Border Force says they will not comment on individual cases. Their full statement is on our website. But Farhad's friends and supporters claim it was punishment for speaking out publicly. Uh, Nick Coatesworth, it's pretty clear that these individuals, there's some 60 of them on level three of the Mantra Hotel in Melbourne, they were brought here under the Medivac legislation. Under the current travel restrictions, they're not going to be sent back to Manus Island and Aru anytime soon. Is it a sustainable long-term option to keep them in these hotel rooms in Preston, Victoria? Well, Hamish, I, I think that the Communicable Diseases Network of, of Australia, which is one of our key committees of infectious disease specialists advising us on COVID-19, ha has been very clear on the requirements for uh, detention, uh, also for correctional facilities and, and for prisons in terms of keeping them safe for COVID-19. Now, that does uh, involve recommendations for physical distancing. That does involve recommendations for very strict controls on uh, staff attendance and, and uh, certainly uh, monitoring the health of people who are in detention. So those 
are um, very clearly stipulated. It's a very comprehensive document. I must say, though, that it is uh, not the roles of the uh, health officials in Australia to necessarily make, um, make uh, the decisions about uh, what happens to the detainees, except to say that our health advice to keep them safe from COVID-19 has been very clear. You were the president of Médecins Sans Frontières. Are you disturbed to hear these stories of people being held, uh, not being allowed outside because of the COVID restrictions uh, in a hotel room for a prolonged period of time? Well, Hamish, all I can say is that, uh, you know, the, clear, the, the, the um, advice we've given has been absolutely clear about how people should be kept safe for COVID-19, uh, how that's implemented by other parts of the government. Uh, I'd have to leave that uh, question to them, but it's important that we keep everybody under our responsibility uh, safe from COVID-19 uh, uh, in Australia and also uh, those who we have responsibility over. All right. Well, we will keep an eye on that story for you. We've had a lot of interest from you in it. That's all we've got time for tonight. A huge thanks to our panel, Lisa Jackson-Pulver, Nick Coatesworth, Mark Scott and Leanne Davies. And a thank you to you at home for joining the conversation. We're really enjoying seeing all of your videos come in from across the country. Please join me next week for a look at Australia in a post-COVID world. We'll be joined by Dave Sharma, Penny Wong, Michael Fullilove and Elaine Pearson. And we'll leave you tonight with your videos of online experiences, online learning experiences at home. Uh, we know it's a pretty tricky time, but clearly some of you are having some fun. Thanks for being with us. Good night. Hi, q &A. My name's Jagger, and this is my remote learning setup. Jin Tian, washware, honey. So then I just sort of talk about the lesson and it automatically animates the rest of the video. Some of my colleagues have opted for drawing tablets so they can have a virtual whiteboard. But I went old school. I got an awesome stick on one. Welcome to Virtual Cuppa. What is a song that you like with a number in the title? Just me and you, just me and you.